Welcome back friends, welcome to another video tutorial from Shomus Biology and in this series of videos actually we are talking about carbohydrate metabolism and in this particular video I am going to talk about pentose phosphate pathway which is also known as uh, the hexose monophosphate shunt. So what this pentose phosphate pathway stands for triple P means. Now the thing you know about the pentose phosphate pathway is that this pathway is required for the generation of NADPH which is a very important molecule and is required for many of the reductive biosynthesis pathways in our body. Now normally how many times you see that NAD or NADP is involved with a pathway where the enzyme dehydrogenase is catalyzing the reaction converting NAD or NADP into NADH or NADPH. We have seen the reduction of NAD or NADP but the reduced form of NAD and NADP that is NADH and NADPH also plays a vital role in most of the anabolic pathways. So if I uh, give you a short example for that it's simply uh, we know that we have NADP converted to NADPH. This is the pathway and this is mostly in case of catabolic, catabolic pathways. But if you go anabolic pathways, most of these NADPH are required for the anabolic pathways and we call them reductive biosynthesis, reductive biosynthesis pathways. Example of such pathway, if I tell you, one such example is fatty acid synthesis. So you see fatty acid synthesis is one of the very important anabolic pathway in our body and that thing requires NADPH. But normally most of the catabolic pathway already have this process of uh, NAD to NADP to be utilized. So how can we produce this NADPH that will be required for this process of pentose uh, for the process of uh, bio reductive biosynthesis processes. So for that reason, for the production of this NADPH, we need pentose phosphate pathway to continue in our body. This is one thing. The second thing that we require this pathway is that during this pathway uh, of pentose phosphate pathway, this, this, this process, we not only produce NADPH, but also what we do, we also produce another very important molecule that is ribose sugar, right? the 5 carbon ribose sugar and we know utilizing glucose as a substrate and series of reactions we get to get ribose 5 phosphate and ribose 5 phosphate is a material to produce nucleic acid. So ribose 5 phosphate production and NADPH production these are two very very important molecules that we need for many other anabolic reactions in our body and processes. That's why we need pentose phosphate pathway for our body cells to become ready for most of this reductive biosynthesis pathways uh, like nucleic acid synthesis, fatty acid synthesis and so on. So now as we know why pentose phosphate pathway is an important pathway. The simple thing about pentose phosphate pathway you will see that it will involve with aldolase and ketolase enzymes in most of the cases uh, and the dehydrogenase enzymes but mostly aldolase and ketolase enzymes that will help to interchange between different carbon numbers in the, in the sugar molecules. For example glucose is a 6 carbon sugar while ribose is a 5 carbon sugar here. Similarly, there are erythrose which is a 4 carbon sugar and sedoheptulose is a 7 uh, carbon sugar. So you see there is a there are variations between them. If let's say 2 6 carbon uh, sugars participate in the reaction with the help of aldolase and ketolase, it can convert and give us 1 3 carbon and 1 7 carbon or simply uh, along with uh, such thing similar like that. That is going to give you the idea about interchanging sugar molecules during the pathway of pentose phosphate. So let's look at the second part of this video where I'll tell you the sequential stages of every enzyme catalytic reactions of pentose phosphate pathway where you can see the details. Okay friends, now let's talk about the pentose phosphate pathway. 
The pentose phosphate pathway, sometimes also called as the hexose monophosphate pathway or hexose monophosphate shunt, is majorly it's a route the cell uses to make NADPH, which is an important molecule for biosynthetic reactions and for reducing oxidative damage inside the cell. Okay. That is the major importance of pentose phosphate pathway to produce a lot of NADPH. Okay. Normally inside the cell, those uh, catabolic reactions usually demand the presence of uh, this NADPH um, in the production of the target molecules. But uh, that can be recycled also. And if we don't recycle that NADPH, uh, and production of NADPH from NADP or reversion of that, it can lead to the problem. The pathway divided into two different branches. First is the oxidative portion of pentose phosphate pathway and second is the non-oxidative part of the pentose phosphate pathway. An oxidative branch of two irreversible reactions and a non-oxidative branch which operates in the direction dictated by the immediate metabolic needs of the cell. So it depends on the cell's demand. Together, both of these oxidative and non-oxidative pathways allow the shuttling of carbons between the 5 carbon and the 6 carbon sugars. Let's go to the details. The first step of the oxidative pathway is the NADPH is produced when the glucose 6-phosphate is converted into glucose 6-phosphoglucolactose. Uh, so this is the step where it requires glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase enzyme which will attach this hydrogen or which will actually reduce NADP into NADPH in this process. NADPH is crucial to keep the glutathione in its reduced form to prevent the oxidative damage of the cell because if the glutathione gets oxidized in that case it will start making uh, degradations inside the cell further consequence of the downstream processes we'll talk about the glutathione later to talk about what is the actual importance of glutathione reduction and oxidation stages now if you look at here this process is not that complicated where there is a change of uh, the structural units where you see here there is a CHO that bond is converted to COO and the hydrogen is donated to NADP to convert it into NADPH. The second step which is also an irreversible step it is further converted that 6-phosphogluconolactone is further converted into 6-phosphogluconate and 6-phosphogluconate from 6-phosphogluconolactone is mediated by lactonase enzyme and this process simply provides water molecules it requires water molecule molecule to convert that gluconolactone into 6-phosphogluconate and then after that that 6-phosphogluconate or 6-phosphogluconic acid you can say is convert into it's, it's converted into ribulose 5 phosphate this, this is the second step where the NADPH will be produced again. The second molecule of NADPH that will be produced again. And this production because when the 6-phosphogluconate is oxidized at the C3, if you look at here, it is oxidized at the C3 and gives the enzyme bound beta keto acid which then readily decarboxylates to yield the ribulose 5-phosphate. Whenever this oxidation is done at C3, NADP is converted to NADPH and the CO that is a CO2 released readily because it's not stable here to maintain a structure. So CO2 gets released and it forms ribulose 5-phosphate. So from a 6-carbon molecule, it generates 5-carbon molecule here. And this is another importance of pentose phosphate pathway. I told you earlier that the major importance of pentose phosphate pathway is to develop NADPH because NADPH will be required in the further process inside the cell as well as it requires to prevent the cell from oxidative damages. But the second importance of pentose phosphate pathway is that this pathway also recirculates between different carbon number containing components of 
the sugar. It can recirculate and shuffle between 6 carbon, 5 carbon, 7 carbon, 4 carbon, 3 carbon molecules of sugar inside our body. That's a very important thing to observe. This step of conversion of 6-phosphogluconate into ribulose 5-phosphate requires the enzyme 6-phosphogluconate dehydrogenase. You remember always whenever there is a dehydrogenase enzyme, it definitely relates with any process to NAD to NADH conversion or NADP to NADPH conversion. Okay. Now, the key point to remember is that the decarboxylation of the beta keto acid can occur spontaneously. That's not a part played by the enzyme. Enzyme only plays the part of rearrangement. Enzyme only plays the part of providing the hydrogen to the NADP. Okay. Now, the process can be faster. It can lead faster if they have this enzyme. That is the only advantage for having an enzyme in this step of the reaction. Now, once they form this ribulose 5-phosphate, in a, now it will start a reversible start, start of reactions where all the products that we'll see further will be a product of the reversible reactions. And in this case, they use enzymes called epimerase that inverts the configuration between the ribulose 5-phosphate and xylulose 5-phosphate. Okay, so because they are very much similar in structure, little variations, now those things keeps on modifying uh, between themselves because it's simple isomer changes. And the enzyme involved in that in this case is the epimerase enzyme. Now ribulose 5-phosphate also can be converted into ribose 5-phosphate for use in biosynthesis of nucleotide derivatives inside our cell. So that can also be done. Now in this case also they use isomerase. Remember ribulose 5-phosphate is an isomer of the ribose 5-phosphate but xylulose is an epimer of ribulose 5-phosphate. Now, if you want to know what is epimer, what is isomer, I'll uh, I'll tell you to watch uh, my videos regarding that as other video in my channel regarding isomer and epimer. So you can watch that video to get the idea about it. Now the key point for this reaction is although the substrates and enzymes are different, but the chemistry of the isomerase reaction is just like uh, the process we see in case of two isomerases in glycolysis reactions. Okay, but though the situation is a lot different here. Then if you look at the second round or second stages of reactions, what we can see is the rest of the non-oxidative pathways repetition of a theme. That is an aldolase and ketolase are used as substrates in a reversible reaction produced another aldolase and ketolase. So in every situation, in every set, you will find one aldolase and one ketolase and they will produce another aldolase and ketolase. And these reactions are always reversible. But the direction of the reaction is not allosterically controlled. But it responds to metabolic pressures at the top and the bottom of the path. And depending upon the pressure and requirement, it modifies uh, the idea. It modifies which one is going to be produced, which aldoles and ketoles is going to be produced. Now the enzymes involved in all these processes are known as transketolase enzyme. For example, it's, it can start using xylulose 5-phosphate and it can uh, also use that uh, ribose 5-phosphate. Now if you take both of them down here, then it converts them back to glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate and pseudoheptulose 7-phosphate. You know, the total number of carbon will be maintained and that is 10. If you look at here, xylulose 5-phosphate and ribose 5-phosphate, the total number of carbons present, 10. And that should be maintained because when they are converting again into glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, 3, 3 carbon, and pseudoheptulose 7-phosphate, 7, 7 carbon. So adding them 7 and 3 gives you 10. So that will remain constant here. And similarly, this process will continue on and on by the several rounds. For example, this glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate can also take pseudoheptulose 7-phosphate and again with another type of transaldolase uh, enzyme reactions, it will produce fructose 6-phosphate and erythrose 4-phosphate. Now adding fructose 6-phosphate that is 4 and erythrose 4-phosphate contains, uh, fructose 6-phosphate contains 6 carbon, erythrose 4-phosphate contains 4 carbon, ultimately gives you the 10 carbon. So in all these stages, either be catalyzed by transaldolase 
or can be catalyzed by trans ketolase but ultimately they will be shuffling the aldose and ketose uh, that is the structures repetition that will keep on occurring between them okay and the key point for this is that this trans ketolase and trans aldolase reactions the keto sugar is always the fragment donor and is shortened while the aldose is always the fragment acceptor and get latent remember that always so the keto sugar is always get shortened because it will be the donor and the aldo will be uh, increased because it's a receptor in always this processes it's true for every process and if you look at ultimately at the end again uh, the same type of situation if you take this one like xylose uh, xylulose 5 phosphate and glyceraldehyde uh, 3 phosphate here here the conversion of all these three that will also be the same type of process either being catalyzed by transketolase or uh, transaldolase so remember that this pathway contains several glycolytic intermediates and when the body requires ribose 5-phosphate for the formation of nucleotides, it can be produced either through the oxidative branch backward through the non-oxidative branch from this glycolytic intermediates. And that's very important because it's going to add a feeder pathway to the glycolysis that states that we can take ribose 5-phosphate here, produced nucleotides easily. And it can also be related with the glycolysis as well as in multiple regions wherein glucose 6-phosphate, wherein glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, fructose 6-phosphate intermediate regions. So this is a very intelligent and clever process inside the cell uh, to not only balance and produce NADPH but also uh, to utilize them and also to, to utilize interchangeable format of uh, the different sugar compounds. So that in a sense is a very very important step.